It's been nearly three months since Halo Infinite released, and to this very day, I've struggled to decide what I actually think of it. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it somewhere slap bang in the middle? Honestly, I think an argument could be made for all three, which is why I've decided to put together a series of videos examining Halo Infinite's campaign in detail from beginning to end. As we progress through it, I'll touch on the game's highlights, where there's room for improvement, and pinpoint any missed opportunities I think developer 343 Industries had to do something more with the the goal of hopefully being able to decide once and for all where Infinite sits quality-wise among the many entries in the Halo series. So sit back, relax, and maybe even crack open a delicious can of your favourite Halo branded energy drink as we get things started with a look at how Halo Infinite's opening and its following two missions play out. Oh, and before we go any further, do also note that there will be spoilers for the entire game here, there, and everywhere from this point onwards. Infinite's very first shot is of Zeta Halo suspended in space, which I don't think is an accident at all given how similar it is to Halo Combat Evolve's opening scene. 343 Industries were very vocal about their desire to create an open world successor to Bungie's first title during Infinite's development, but even if they hadn't, I think how close the two are tells you everything you need to know about their intentions moving forwards. The cutscene which follows depicting the attack on the Infinity is almost entirely fantastic. I'm one of those people who felt that this cutscene the beginning of Halo 5 was perhaps a bit too much, so witnessing this more grounded depiction of Master Chief is something I really enjoyed. My big problem with this scene, however, is how Atriox is introduced. Atriox's arrival was no doubt an exciting one for fans of the series who had played Halo Wars 2 prior, a game which featured the Banished as its primary antagonist, but for the far larger portion of the audience who most likely hadn't, I don't think it works all too well. Watching him toss Master Chief around like a ragdoll before throwing him off the Infinity and leaving him for dead is a great display of what a threat he is, but for much of the rest of Infinite, he's nowhere to be seen. Sure, he's mentioned a lot, and is eventually reintroduced during the game's ending, but his brief appearance followed by his sudden disappearance I think might have been somewhat jarring for those who barely knew who he was to begin with. I'm all for introducing a new villain to the mainline series early on, if they're actually going to hang around once the game begins proper. Honestly, I think this sequence really needed to be playable to help better explain who Atriox and the Banished are and what was actually happening, as well as how events actually connected to Halo 5. And on a somewhat separate note before we move on, Atriox, a supposed tactical mastermind, throwing Master Chief off the Infinity without actually confirming that he was dead is James Bond villain levels of stupidity. It's dramatic, yes, but also very dumb. Moving swiftly from CG to in-game cinematics, we meet a fresh-faced Echo 216 for the first time and catch a fairly brief glimpse of his family. Okay, Daddy's listening. Can you say hi? Hi. And... Show Daddy how big you are. Can you say? So big. So big. Good. And can you sing? Very high. Good singing. This is a plot thread I have real issues with. I don't want to talk about it too much for now, as it's something I'll touch on in greater detail during later moments in the campaign, but it's definitely worth highlighting at this stage, as Infinite sets them up to be an important part of the game's story from very early on, without ever really managing to follow through on things properly. I've nothing negative whatsoever to say about the scene which follows. This is UNSC Pelican Echo 216. Can you hear me? It's one which feels very Halo through and through, and those familiar piano chords get me every time. After some tinkering here and there, 216 powers Chief up and proceedings switch to a first-person perspective. Much like Infinite's opening shot was a clear callback to Halo Combat Evolved, so too I believe is the scene which follows. In the original Halo, you stand at a calibration station and look at a series of lights, whereas in this modern iteration you're tasked with following 216's flashlight thing. It's a small nitpick, but there is something I always find unsettling about Echo 216's eyes here. The facial animations themselves are quite good, but his eyes have this intense quality which doesn't look quite right to me, although as I say, this is a minor problem and honestly it could just be me. Master Chief then lays eyes on the now partially destroyed Zeta Halo before the ship is rocked by an approaching banished craft. Chief is a fairly chatty Cathy during Infinite and his dialogue is by far the best in the game out of any character. I'd go so far as to say it's almost pitch perfect. No, 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 not then, not again, we need to run. 
I need a weapon. Weapon? This is all I've got. It's enough. Wait, what? What are you gonna do? Improvise. Close the door. And it's not just through his dialogue that 343 does a good job of showing what kind of a man Chief is. As he makes his way towards the Gabracken, you might notice how gentle he is with the deceased Marine he has to move out the way, as well as with the soldier he takes an assault rifle from, which is in stark contrast to the jackal he flings away without a second thought. At which point, it's time to board the ship. Warship Gabracken is Infinite's first mission, and while it's not the most exciting ever featured in a Halo title, I really enjoy it. It's functional in that it slowly ramps things up over time, it packs in plenty of exposition, and finishes with a very entertaining set piece, something the game's campaign as a whole at times I think sorely lacks. There's not a whole lot to write home about in the opening hangar, but it does give you space to get used to some of the game's basics. You're introduced to the scanning mechanic, one which can be surprisingly useful but that I often forgot to use, and there's several grunts dotted about the area that you can whack on the back or dispatch with bullets to give you your first, albeit very easy, slice of combat in a controlled environment. Making use of the grappling hook is also required to progress forward, which makes sense given how incredibly important a tool it is during the vast majority of the game, and until I played the mission a few times for the making of this video, I actually didn't realise you could choose between progressing forwards via the right or left hand sides of the hangar. I always used the right side during previous playthroughs without even realising there was another option. I suppose I'm simply a lot less observant than I like to think I am. A lot of the areas during these early stages are your bread and butter Halo encounters, with the introduction of the first brute you take on being a particularly memorable moment. He charges straight at you and isn't carrying a weapon, making it a nice smooth introduction to one of the more powerful enemies you you'll regularly encounter over the course of the game. There's also further mention of Atriox. That, that hologram. It's Atriox. He led the attack on the Infinity. He was looking for something. He... He killed everyone. I know. We met. But my issue again lies with the fact that despite seeing how powerful he is during the introduction, and here being told how important he is, the main brute antagonist during Infinite is actually Escherum. The constant mentions of Atriox feel like they lessen Escherum's impact somewhat. As you'll find during the campaign, and especially when you take him on towards its end, Escherum is certainly no pushover, but he's also devalued in my mind by how much he is often forced to share the limelight with the absent Atriox. There's no doubt Escherum himself is a threat, but I always had a niggling feeling in the back of my mind that my goal during the campaign was to take down a henchman, a very powerful henchman in fairness, rather than the real deal. After witnessing the scale of the Banished's operations via the enormous number of drop bases waiting to be deployed, you board a lift to the ship's upper levels, and during the ride you get your first proper example of 216's relentless cynicism. This is something I'll come back to again at least once or twice later in the campaign, but what I will say is that at this early stage I don't have such a problem with it. Once the game is in full swing, and you've found the weapon is when it becomes much more of a problem. In my view, 343's writing can at times quickly devolve into the weapon does a lot of quips and Echo 216 does a lot of complaining, where I would have preferred more rounded writing with a greater focus on building out the characters in question, Echo 216 in particular. Dropships, an invasion force. How do we stand a chance against all this? The banished one already. We could be the only two humans left alive out here then there's still hope. Once out of the elevator, there's another nice callback to Halo combat evolved in the grenade hallway in its first mission, the Pillar of Autumn. There you were given ample opportunity to chuck ample grenades at Covenant forces from relative safety, and here Infinite puts its own spin on things as you lob explosives down a hallway at an incoming group of grunts and jackals. There are a few more banished squads to fight your way through in the next few areas, including this jackal corridor which again introduces you to a new enemy in a tightly controlled environment, after which you take on a large number of brutes in the most open environment so far. The first time I played Infinite, this was where I began to get super excited about the game's combat. As I danced around the arena using the grappling hook to reposition, the game really started to come to life, and I began to dream about all the weird and wonderful ways 343 could no doubt expand on these very strong opening moments. Of course, as we all know now, a lot of the campaign's missions do end up being very, very repetitive compared to other games in the series, but at this stage, I must confess I was rather excited about what was to come. When the dust settles and the process of scuttling the ship begins, Escherum appears and does his best to be threatening. 
point it's time to escape the ship. The following sequence may mostly consist of running down hallways as stuff happens around you, but it's exhilarating nonetheless, and the electrified floor in one room, swiftly followed by the longer and much more exciting movement section during which you leap and grapple your way from falling drop base to falling drop base, serves to highlight how important movement and the grappling hook will be during the rest of the game, and it encourages you to think in those terms from a very early point. Fortunately, Chief manages to escape in just the nick of time, and you get this lovely shot of Zeta Halo before you're picked up by Echo 216. Cue title screen. The Banished finally get a little more fleshed out at this point, as you meet a rogues gallery of some of the tougher enemies you'll face during the campaign, including Tremonius in the shorter term, as well as the yet unnamed Blade Master. This ring will be operational. Please. There. You will have your revenge. Blade Master. Follow the Spartan from a distance. I want to know everything about him. And after quite a lot more cynicism from 216 and some reinsurance from Master Chief, Infinite rolls straight into its second mission, Foundation. I told you. We lost. We need help, not heroics. No, we do our duty. Protect humanity, whatever the cost. I can't be the only- Entering atmosphere, autopilot disengaging in five. We have a new mission, soldier. Four. What is it? What's down there? Three. A weapon. Two. A weapon? One. How many guns do you need? What is wrong with you? Remind me to never pick up his Spartan. This is a terrible idea. They're coming for us. All of them. Nothing overly exciting happens during the early stages of this mission, so I think this is the perfect moment to talk about the Forerunner structures featured in the campaign. This is an area where I think in general 343 did an amazing job. I've always struggled with the Forerunner architecture in the Halo series in general. It's often repetitive, uninteresting, and in the case of games like Halo Combat Evolves Anniversary Edition and Halo 5, also horrendously over-designed. To begin with at least, the first two issues are nowhere near as glaring as they are elsewhere. Yes, the Forerunner structures are used way, way too many times, and by the game's midpoint you will no doubt be completely and utterly bored of exploring them over and over again, but at this point in the campaign, they really work. The level design features plenty of verticality across environments larger than in most previous Halo titles, and they're varied enough that events never come anywhere close to feeling as miserable as, say, moving through the same area repeatedly like you would in missions such as Assault on the Control Room in Combat Evolved, or Sacred Icon in Halo 2. Like I said, this initial brilliance does dissipate fairly quickly once you realise they make up an extraordinary amount of the campaign, but during these initial stages, they do impress. What arguably loses much less of its impact over time is their aesthetic. This is the best Forerunner structures have ever looked in a Halo title. They take their cue from Bungie's earlier titles and still use the familiar muted bluey-grey colour palette, but with just the right level of visual flourish added that they look futuristic and alien without ever feeling over-designed. Compare them with this scene from Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary, or this scene from Halo 5, to how they look in Infinite, and I think the vast improvement is plain to see. Again, they are overused without a shadow of a doubt, but that absolutely does not in any way take away from the fact that they are really well designed. Eventually, you'll come across the first Silexes you'll encounter during the game and are introduced to the weapon. It's been six months, where have you been? What happened? Where is Cortana? The rogue AI known as Cortana is gone. She's been deleted. How? By you? Of course not. Did you hit your head or something? Don't you remember? 
My instructions were to enter this installation, imitate Cortana, and lock her down for retrieval. Yours were to take her back to the Infinity for deletion. So if it wasn't you... Okay then. And this is where, after being pretty relieved at how good a job 343 Industries had done up until this point, I began to put my head firmly in my hands. I understand that Cortana going rogue was not an altogether popular decision with some. I understand that 343 may have felt some pressure to change the direction of the story following a fan backlash, but to so casually reveal that Cortana had already been deleted is, to me, a complete and utter travesty. Cortana is the second most important character in the entire series, after Master Chief himself, and her story was nowhere near done at the end of Halo 5. In case you've not played that game in a while, here's what happened. Slip space coordinates locked in. Krypton secure. Goodbye, Mr. Lock. I have control again! What? What are you doing? What happened? Did we save them? It is too late. The Symphony's drives are activated. You can't... Exuberant. What is... Constructors. This is a builder facility after all. I was installed by the builders. I served the builders. No! Stop it! You took my installation. I will take something of yours. And yet by the time Infinite rolls around, she's already long gone. It's one thing to want to change the course of the story, but I find this staggeringly lazy. Towards the start of the video, I spoke about how Infinite's opening needed more exposition and possibly a playable sequence to better set the scene, but that complaint pales in comparison to what happens here. I must of course also add the caveat that Cortana's actions in between Five and Infinite are expanded on to some degree later on in the campaign. For example, you have this scene illustrating what she did to the Brutes homeworld, and another towards the end of the campaign which explains her actions in more detail. However, none of this makes up for the huge gap in the story left by this sudden jump from angry rogue AI Cortana to deleted Cortana. It's clear 343 wanted the game to be a fresh start for the series, but the desire to begin things anew does not make up for the enormous hole left in the series narrative. In story terms, Halo Infinite already has the problem of feeling like a prequel to something far bigger due to how the Endless are handled. 343 spends a lot of time talking about how terrifying their return would be, and yet by the end of the game you still lack any true understanding of what they actually are, but that perhaps could have been excused if a good job had been done of connecting things with Halo 5 and properly tying up a lot of the loose threads left over from that game. Unfortunately, however, that doesn't happen, so what you're left with is a game that feels like it's floating in space, disconnected from previous events in the series, while also not using its newly clean slate to do anything particularly spectacular with its story. And I can assure you, this definitely won't be the last time this issue rears its ugly head as we continue to work our way through the campaign. Massive criticisms of the stories set up aside, I can't help but like the weapon and her dynamic with Master Chief. I've already mentioned that her dialogue can be a little too quip-focused at times, but I do have to give 343 some credit here in that I can see the logic. Echo 216 is the older jaded companion, while the weapon is younger and more upbeat, which does often create a nice contrast, with Master Chief acting as the straight man landing somewhere in between the two. Where Master Chief's relationship with Cortana erred more on the romantic side of things, the two were, to some degree peers who cared deeply about each other, his relationship with the weapon is more that of a father and child. There can be no argument that to some extent she is Cortana 2.0. Her inclusion is an obvious attempt to continue the Spartan AI dynamic beloved by most fans of the series, but I'm glad 343 at least mixed it up enough that it feels fresh, something I'll again continue to highlight as we delve deeper into Infinite's story. Moving on through the level, you have way more references to Cortana than is really necessary considering my previous comments, a short scene with Dr. Catherine Halsey, and a couple of very well-constructed encounters with the Banished. They all feature multiple different lanes you can choose to fight through, plenty of cover, and are expansive enough that there's always room for the grappling hook to play a role. Weapon variety continues to increase as well, with the Stalker rifle, turrets, and others coming into play. You're afforded more options, but at a steady rate, which is something I really like about the Foundation and the mission which precedes it. 
Up next is some solid environmental storytelling in the form of the carnage which litters the room where you find down Spartan Benita Stone, as well as a short scene hinting that the banished Blade Master introduced earlier is now somewhere on Zeta Halo. Let's see what I can find out about her. Accessing. This is Spartan Bonita Stone, recon specialist. Her vitals have been offline for nearly a month. Cause of death was an energy blade, but different, stronger. A single strike. She never saw it coming. And much like Warship Grabacken, this is followed by a final encounter which is by far the best in the mission. It's not the opening encounter itself I want to talk about however, but rather this Silex, which can be found on the opposite side of the area from where you find the power seed needed to get the elevator back online. I don't know what this is. Earlier Silexes clearly stored humans, grunts and other species we are familiar with, but this one looks a little different. This may have been explained somewhere else, so apologies in advance if I'm barking up the wrong tree here, but to me it looks a lot like a flood infection form. That would definitely make sense given there's only one compared to the many we see containing other species. We know that a single flood spore is enough to contaminate an entire planet, so keeping a single infection form would be all that was needed in terms of indexing, minimising the risk to the forerunners while still keeping a sample to hand. Bringing down the elevator, you meet Tremonius and begin the Foundation's boss encounter. And it is okay. I absolutely detest the shield and health bars included, but I can see why they're necessary as bullet sponge enemies become frustrating very quickly when you have no idea of how much damage you actually need to do to kill them. Whether including a bullet sponge boss encounter is even appropriate is also up for debate, but considering many of the campaign's missions are relatively bland otherwise, they do help end some of them on a more memorable note than they otherwise would have. Have. Either way, the encounter is pretty decent and a difficult enough challenge, although I would have preferred to fight Tremonius alone without backup, as it feels like a cheap way of increasing the encounter's difficulty. Once he's been dispatched, Chief finally escapes the facility once and for all, with one final surprise waiting for him, one which hints at darker things to come, before you open the doors to the outside world and are finally able to gaze upon the beauty of Zeta Halo. And this, I think, is a good place to end the first video in this series. Up to this point, I I think Halo Infinite does a pretty good job of introducing you to its mechanics, a less stellar job of connecting its narrative to previous titles, and lands somewhere between the two when it comes to characterisation. Will it continue to toe that line as Master Chief's journey progresses during my next video covering the game's campaign up to its halfway point? Well, you'll just have to wait and see. Thanks for taking the time to watch the video, boys, girls and Spartans. If you enjoyed it and want to be informed of when part 2 drops, do consider subscribing to the channel, and do also let me know what you thought of Halo Infinite's opening, and hopefully I'll see you again for part 2.